So my name is Carrie Bingen. I have the privilege of moderating our second fireside chat this afternoon. Uh, and I get to introduce to the stage the Honorable Deborah Lee James and Admiral Paul Zakunt. Both of them joined Hawkeye's advisory board earlier this year, and we're really lucky to be able to draw on all of their experiences and insights. So Secretary James is the 23rd Secretary of the Air Force. Keeping with our House Armed Services Committee theme here, she started her career as a staffer on HASC's Military Personnel and Compensation Subcommittee. She went on to serve as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs, then Chief Operating Officer at the Business Executives for National Security Organization, and subsequently as President of SAIC's Technology and Engineering Sector. Currently, she is the Chair of the Defense Business Board. She's an accomplished author, but I have to say what I really admire is all the engagement that she's done with younger folks, sharing her experiences and offering professional advice. Admiral Zakumft is the 25th Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. He has served in Coast Guard leadership roles across the Pacific and the Atlantic. Notably, in 2010, he was served as the federal on-scene coordinator for the Deepwater Horizon spill, where he directed the response to the largest oil spill in U.S. history. He has led leadership positions at the Joint Inter Interagency Task Force West, U.S. Pacific Command, and was commander of Coast Guard Pacific Area. It's really safe to say that there are few people that understand the maritime environment as well as Admiral Zakumt. So I want to start there. I want to start on maritime in the Indo-Pacific. From your time in the Coast Guard and the multitude of missions and deployments that you've undertaken, what were some of your biggest maritime operational challenges and gaps? And how can commercial RF data help address these challenges, particularly as you look to the Indo-Pacific region and beyond those traditional defense and intelligence missions. Yeah, thank you, Carrie, for that very kind introduction. And I wish I could say I knew everything about maritime, <laughs> but if you can imagine you have a, a widescreen TV and you've got 100 pixels on that TV, and that's what I had as a theater commander and even as a service chief. I had about 100 pixels of what was happening in the maritime domain. Uh, as an operator, I uh, commanded three ships, uh, and in the Indo-Pacific region, as we're trying to find those high threat areas, you're literally boring a hole through what I would call a liquid desert because we did not know where the threats were. Uh, now we had priorita prioritized intelligence requirements, but as many of you all know, uh, that that pie is not distributed equitably. Uh, in the case of Iraq and Afghanistan, the global war on terrorism, uh, we were lucky to get crumbs to, to devote ISR to the threats that we had a high sense of awareness that were operating in the domain, but we couldn't get those resources uh, to provide us the queuing that we needed to direct resources to conduct at sea interdiction operations. So um, it was a challenge then, it's gonna be a challenge now. As, as we look at, you know, two thirds of the world is, is water. Um, and, and we're looking at nefarious actors as you've seen across the full spectrum from national security to humanitarian to environmental to illegal fishery, human trafficking, it's, it's all out there. Because it's been an open playing field for them because they can hide. Uh, what Hawkeye 360 brings to the table is you can run but if you talk, you cannot hide. Um, and then the next piece of that is having the authorities and having the resources in play to not just use this information, but actually to affect an end game. That's super to hear. Well, Secretary James, if I can take a step back here. When you look at the broader issue of strategic competition with China, global technology trends and strategic challenges ahead of us, what's at stake here? And what role do commercial space capabilities like Hawkeye play in that broader strategic competition? Well, first I wanna say thank you, Carrie, for including me on this panel, and thanks to all of you for joining us here this afternoon. I really do hope you'll stay on and see some of the great capabilities in action that the advisory board saw earlier this morning. And thirdly, I just wanna say how, um, how grateful I feel as a former Secretary of the Air Force to be talking about maritime issues <laughs> with my distinguished <laughs> colleagues from the, from the sea services. So I'll just, I'll just begin by saying there's a huge amount at stake at present in this era of great power competition. You said the key word, the C word, China. Obviously, China is the pacing threat for the US military today for a variety of reasons. It's economic might, 
its growing military might. It has today the largest uh, navy in the world. And where it sits, near the South China Sea and that corridor where two thirds of the, of the world's trade mm -hmm. passes through. And that plus our concern and our uh, mutual concern with other allies about the future of Taiwan. You add all of this up and this is a, a major concern. But you know what? It's not the only concern. I, you can look, look across every single region of the world today and you could come up with concerns uh, to the U.S. government, to our allies and partners. The threats are out there. And by the way, those are regions. Let's talk domains. Every single domain nowadays Start from the top, space, cyber, air, sea, ground, undersea. We are facing challenges in all of those domains. So we just have to um, work, work on these matters over time. I think we also have to remember as American citizens that the fantastic investments and the fantastic technologies of yesterday that brought us to where we are today, and we are still the best military in the world as far as I'm concerned, those technologies will not be sufficient to carry us into the future, given all of these threats to the domains and across the globe. So this is where some of the new technologies come into play. Um, and we've been working on this for what, at least five, six, seven years. Um, I'm talking about technologies like um, artificial intelligence, I'm talking about aut autonomy, robotics. I'm talking about more investment in quantum science, space, cyber, um, um, and ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance of different uh, varieties. Having been Secretary of the Air Force, having dealt extensively with combatant commanders, I can tell you they can never get enough of ISR, understanding the environment around them. And if you step back and say what underpins most of these technologies that I just described, it's data and analyzing that data and getting insights from that data so that decision makers can make decisions quickly. Speed is so very, very important. And at present, we're not speedy enough. And oh, by the way, being able to share that with our allies and partners, that's another key underpinning because we hardly do anything alone as the US military or as the US government. We always act in concert with our partners. You start to wrap all of that together, and that's why I'm so excited about the capabilities of uh, Hawkeye 360 and commercial participation in general to this, to this fight, to this threat environment that we are dealing with. And as you've heard other speakers explain, um, Hawkeye has a constellation of satellites that can collect and ultimately analyze data and help decision makers make speedier decisions about what to do. And it's all centered around collecting data from the RF spectrum. So um, back to the maritime domain. If you are a so-called dark vessel, a vessel at sea that has turned off your AIS because there are nefarious reasons that you want to be hidden. Um, think again, because Hawkeye's capabilities can find you. Similarly, if you are a smuggler, if you are a poacher, if you are engaging in illegal fishing, and by the way, China sometimes operates under the umbrella of being fishermen. But if you are doing it in a way in which you are trying to not be detective, you've turned off some of your signal capability, uh, you will not hide because Hawkeye can, can see you. The final thing I want to say is um, what I like about this is this, this capability in no way tries to replace or even compete with the exquisite collection capabilities of the U.S. government. This is a supplement. And like I said before, the decision makers can never get enough information and the insights that go with it. No, those are all great points. Um, being challenged in all domains, um, it's hard to defeat all those modalities, and clearly what Hawkeye is doing with RF is bringing an additional modality to light where we may have had gaps in the past. And then the shareability of the data uh, with our allies and partners is incredibly important. What does a successful public-private partnership look like? Yeah, Kerry, I think you hit on the key word right there, and it's, it's partnership. And, and I think back to when I was uh, the service chief, and I was meeting with the president of Mexico, the CNO of the Mexican Navy and one of my two-star flag officers, and we're addressing the illicit trafficking threat off the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, the CNO of the Mexican Navy gave this brief, and we call them spaghetti charts. It showed about two or three strands of spaghetti. 
um, of what they knew of illicit activity across the Yucatan Peninsula in the Eastern Pacific. Um, our counter brief from the US side, it, it looked like this red, dark red highway of activity. Thousands of strands of spaghetti, and yet Mexico had two or three. Um, it was an awkward moment for me because clearly the United States, if we're talking partnerships, is not sharing information with a partner because they're not a member of the Five Eye community. Uh, so we need to be serious about what are we going to do to build partnerships. And certainly through the commercial sector, we can do that because we don't have to filter that and say we cannot share this information with you. Um, this to me is a great barrier breakdown, if you will, in terms of what's inhibited transparency and, and really putting meaningfulness into what I would say international partnerships um, who are facing these very same threats. Secretary James. Yeah, I would say that those in government who do the acquisition, contracting officers and the apparatus that supports that, are not always close enough to the users at the tactical edge, so to speak. Uh, they try to be. I think they could do a better job, and users themselves could do a better job of making sure that their requirements and what they need are is explained better. So I think that partnership, if I could call that a partnership, needs to be as close as possible. And by the way, people in industry, they need to be as close as possible to the users so that what industry develops is intuitive, does not require too much training, and is extremely useful to the users. Again, the users at the tactical edge are the most important, in my opinion. So trying to tighten up that loop, and to the extent that government will allow and that it's doable, industry being in the field side by side with the users at the tactical edge, um, that way it can be quick evolution of capability, quick understanding of what's working, what's not, and let's evolve this. Let's rotate this some more. So I think to the degree, and we're doing more of that nowadays, uh, to the degree that we can keep that up, I think that will make for better and better capabilities quickly to the warfighters. Yeah, that's if I can just add to that just briefly, and it's the whole issue of proprietary. Um, you know, if you look at RF, you might say, well, that's proprietary. EO, that's proprietary. SAR, that's proprietary. Imagery, and like, what you really need to do is fuse all of this, integrate this, and that would be my advice to the commercial sector is, is don't think so much proprietary as much as an integrated approach um, to pull all of these layers of information that have tremendous value to the end user. So both those are great points. As today's a start at that, but you know, beyond today, getting those users, those providers together at the edge, side by side, learning from each other and iterating is, is a big message that I heard from both of you. Um, so let me, let me close here and ask both of you, so why did you become a Hawkeye advisor? You are both incredibly in demand. I know you sit on several different boards and um, both you know, pro bono and then helping other companies like ourselves. You know, from your viewpoint with all of these experiences that you've had, everything that you've accomplished in your career, um, what stands out to you about this moment in time? What stands out to you about the commercial ecosystem that you, you are now, you are a part of? Well, as I look out the window, or as I look at what the market is doing, um, I, I don't have a very optimistic view of what's happening in our economy right now to say that we can keep doing the same thing over and over again, and we'll just keep throwing more resources, uh, and we'll see our appropriations continue on a positive glide slope. Uh, we may very well hit a flat line or maybe something less. So our traditional ways of doing business, um, we need to do a tech refresh. Um, we need to look at other options, including commercial. Uh, we always look at data. We used, used to look at platforms. You know, you would buy a platform that would provide you data. Well, you don't need, you know, if you're a DOD, or in my case, Coast Guard under DHS, you don't necessarily need the platform. What you need is the data um, and the analytics piece that go with it. And if you can take yourself out of that platform acquisition and acquire the data, uh, I think that's a very cost-effective uh, cost approach, um, at least from the governmental approach in, in terms of how we need to do business in the future. Uh, I'm just delighted to be a part of that. And we're glad to have you, yeah. Secretary Jay. So for me, it, it comes down to really two things. The, the capability that the company provides, the technology, if you will, and the people. So let me just start with, with the technology. You, you've already heard me describe what's rather unique, in my opinion, about Hawkeye 
uh, not only what you do, the solutions, but the fact that it's shareable with the allies uh, is just huge. Uh, again, when I was Secretary of the Air Force, I went to 44 different countries over the course of three years, would have bilateral or sometimes multilateral discussions everywhere I went, and one of the chief um, issues that they would always bring up to me things that were dissatisfiers was the fact that you know we were so limited in what we could share. So to me, that is just a bonanza of opportunity for the US to extend our partnerships and alliances across the world and to, to deepen them. Um, so that's sort of the technology part. The people part, um, you know, you get to be our age, you get, you get choices as to who you spend your time with. So I wanna spend my time with really interesting and cool people. So when I look at the people of Hawkeye 360, led by John Serafini, you carry, I mean, across the board, you heard this is a very mission-focused uh, company. Almost all of the people who, who work in the company are either military veterans or they're, veteran of, they're veterans of the civil service. They've served in the government. So the mission is not just what they do for a job. The mission is, is, is a passion. It's what they are devoting their their life to, so I, I really like that aspect. On the commercial, generally, the role of commercial, um, I think it's hugely important. Commercial is where so much of the innovation across the United States is happening. You know, the undersecretary for research, Heidi Hsu, in the last few months came out with a list of about 14 different areas that she said represents the future of US uh, deterrence and warfare. And I think something like 10 of those 14 categories, I mentioned some of them earlier, 10 of those 14 are commercial. They're coming out of the commercial world. There's a handful like hypersonics, for example, is pretty much driven by, by uh, DOD or government funding, but the rest are all commercial. So if you want innovation, it's like, you know, they said, why do you rob banks? Well, that's where the money is. If you want innovation, you better be prepared to go, um, better be prepared to go commercial. Thank you for all of the service to the country that you've provided, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank Great. You. Thank you, everyone.